Welcome to Medicare Advantage and the CMS HCC model. Let's get to it. So Medicare is a federal program administered by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, that provides health care coverage for people who are 65 or older or under 65 and receiving Social Security Disability Insurance, or SSDI, for a certain amount of time, or under 65 and have end-stage renal disease, ESRD. Medicare coverage is funded by Social Security taxes and premiums paid by Medicare beneficiaries and through the federal budget. There are four parts of Medicare. Each one helps pay for different health care costs. And we are going to go through those. Uh, let's run through Part A, Part B, Part C, Part D. Part A is hospital insurance. Part B is medical insurance. Part C is oh, the subject of this whole boot camp, really. Uh, Medicare Advantage plans, uh, which replace Part A and Part B. And then Part D is prescription drug coverage. So let's get let's get to it and look at each individually. So part A, hospital insurance covers most medically necessary hospitals, skilled nursing facility, home health, and hospice care. It is an entitlement for people who have paid social security taxes for at least 40 calendar quarters or 10 years. There's four quarters in a year, right? So uh, 40 divided by four is 10. Part A can be purchased at a monthly premium for people who have not accumulated uh, the 40 points or 40 calendar quarters uh, necessary. Part B is medical insurance, okay? This covers most medically necessary doctor services, preventive care, durable medical equipment, hospital outpatient services, lab tests, x-rays, mental health care, and some home health and ambulance services. There is a monthly premium for Part B, and that premium uh, depends on one's income. So Medicare Part A and Part B are the original Medicare programs. Remember, in the early uh, early on, we talked about uh, the um, Title 18 and 19 of the Social Security Act, and uh, back in the mid 60s when Medicare was uh, developed. Okay, and there's a number of different terms you may hear it referred to as original Medicare, traditional Medicare, Medicare basic, and eh, other variations that people have coined. Uh, but it is Medicare Part A and Part B, and these were the original uh, parts of Medicare, Part C and Part D came later. Part C used to be called Medicare Plus Choice, it's now called Medicare Advantage, MA. Uh, that you, you should get used to hearing MA, it's a shortened version. Uh, and this is an alternative to Part A and Part B. Part C is offered by private health insurance companies who are contracted with Medicare to provide Part A and Part B coverage. You can see this is bolded. Medicare Advantage plans must offer at least the same benefits as original Medicare or Part A and Part B. They can do so with, under different rules, costs, and coverage restrictions. Part D covers prescription drugs. It is only offered through private insurance companies who are contracted Medicare. So the CMS does not at all ever pay for prescription drugs, okay? It is that Part D coverage is contracted out, okay? Some Medicare Advantage plans may include Part D coverage, known as Medicare Advantage Prescription Drug or MAPD plans. Enrollment in Part D is not a requirement. However, people who are entitled to Part A or, or enrolled in Part B of original Medicare face a late enrollment penalty if they do not enroll in a Part D plan when they are initially eligible for Medicare or are without prescription drug coverage that covers as much or more than a Medicare drug plan for more than 63 continuous days after being eligible. Um, I always love this because this is a paraphrase from uh, you know, CMS. 
Uh, so while it's not a requirement, that certainly sounds like a requirement, doesn't it? A Medicare beneficiary that is enrolled in a Medicare Advantage plan that pres provides prescription drug coverage may not enroll in a separate Part D plan. If they do, they will be disenrolled from the Medicare Advantage plan and be returned to Medicare Part A and or Part B, whichever they were eligible for and on. Uh, why? I mean, uh, you know, you, you probably heard the term double dipping, okay? Um, if the Medicare Advantage plan is covering the prescription drugs uh, for the patient, um, then the patient should not be getting coverage from a, a, another source, okay? Uh, so that's pretty, pretty logical. Medicare Part A, inpatient hospital deductible and coinsurance and lifetime reserve days per benefit period in 2022 are shown uh, well below and on, on the next slide. The Part A deductible covers beneficiaries' share of costs for the first 60 days of Medicare-covered inpatient hospital care in a benefit period. Beneficiaries must pay coinsur a coinsurance amount per day for the 61st through 90th day of hospitalization in a benefit period and additional coinsurance per day for lifetime reserve days. So that's anything day 91 and beyond, okay? For beneficiaries in skilled nursing facilities, the daily coinsurance for days 21 through 100 of extended care services in a benefit period will be 194.50 in 2022. Let's talk about benefit periods, okay? Um, we'll, we'll cover that on the next slide, but uh, $1,556 deductible for each benefit period, okay? Uh, days one through 60, zero coinsurance because the, the beneficiary is paying the 1556 deductible for days one through 60. Days 61 through 90, each day for days 61 through 90, there is $389 coinsurance per day of each benefit period. These are called coinsurance days. And you may often see, not just in Medicare, but uh, anywhere insurance is involved, uh, you may see COINS, C-O-I-N-S, uh, short, just shortened for coinsurance. Days 91 and beyond, there is a $778 coinsurance per each lifetime reserve day after day 90 for each benefit period, up to 60 days per lifetime, and these are not renewable. So in other words, anytime a beneficiary exceeds 90 days in the hospital, they will be eating up their 60 lifetime reserve days Okay, and once they're gone, they're gone. These do not renew, they're, they're not replenished each year, 60 per lifetime, okay? So if a beneficiary has any, whether it's one, two, whatever, if they have, the, if they have any admissions that go beyond 90 days, they're start going to start consuming these lifetime reserve days and once they have used 60 lifetime reserve days, then uh, beyond that, they are responsible for all costs. So a benefit period begins the day a beneficiary is admitted as an inpatient in a hospital or skilled nursing facility. The benefit period ends when no inpatient hospital care or skilled nursing uh, skilled care and skilled nursing facility has been received for 60 days in a row in other words 61 days from the last discharge okay so uh if a patient is admitted on january 2nd and discharge on january 5th okay then uh 61 days from january 5th would start a new benefit period okay so this is a little different than um, you know, with, with commercial insurance and, you know, insurance that we're familiar with outside of, um, you know, uh, Medicare, um, you know, we, we usually think of an annual deductible or, uh, you know, benefits renewing annually or, you know, a benefit period being an annual, an annual event. 
Um, not, not so with Part A. Um, you know, there's a, a slightly different structure to it. If admitted to a hospital skilled nursing facility after one be one benefit period is ended, then a new benefit period begins. So again, let's look at that January second uh, to January fifth admission. Okay, so let's go February fifth, March fifth. Um, you know, and, and it's actually going to be March sixth, seventh, or eighth probably because of uh, February. Um, then you know, if the patient is admitted in the middle of March. They're going to have to pay the deductible again, okay? Beneficiary must pay the inpatient deductible for each benefit period. There's no limit to the number of benefit periods, although mathematically uh, only five are possible. I don't think you can squeeze a sixth in there, okay? Um, but so so a, a really ill, unlucky beneficiary could have five benefit periods in a year. Um, and that would be um, that would be unfortunate. Part B, the annual deductible for all Medicare Part B beneficiaries is two hundred and thirty three dollars in twenty twenty two. After the deductible is met, coverage is uh, offered at eighty uh, percent with a twenty percent coinsurance. So Medicare pays eighty percent of the approved amount, and the beneficiary is responsible for twenty percent. And since 2020, beneficiaries are not grand beneficiaries that are not grandfathered or were not grandfathered are not uh, eligible for supplemental insurance that will cover the Part B deductible. Um, plans like AARP and uh, and other uh, other plans uh, up until 2020, um, you know, uh, beneficiaries could purchase supplemental insurance that would cover the 20% and uh, the deductible, uh, those plans can still cover the 20%, uh, but uh, uh, regulations changed in 2020, and uh, the Part D deductible must always be paid by the patient. Medicare beneficiaries who enroll in Part C, Medicare Advantage, must continue to pay the Part, B, Part A and B premium. The cost sharing for Part C varies. Some plans charge premiums in addition to the Part A and Part B premiums. Some do not. Most Medicare Advantage plans offer additional benefits that are not covered with the original Medicare, such as vision, hearing, dental, and other health and wellness programs. Uh, in most cases, the total cost sharing in Part C is lower than original Medicare, which provides great incentive for Medicare beneficiaries to elect uh part c coverage okay um and there's actually a, a regulation um and perhaps you've seen tv ads uh with joe namath um for those who know who joe namath is uh ex nfl uh quarterback from the 1960s uh in early 70s but um there's actually a regulation where uh where part b or the part b can be returned uh to the the patient, so really, the you know, um, as opposed to twenty percent of every visit, uh, you know, a copay of twenty dollars or five, ten, fifteen, twenty dollars, twenty five dollars, whatever, um, you know, you know, of course, every person has to look at their situation uh, from their unique perspective, but um, really, there, there there's a lot of upsides to uh, Medicare Advantage for beneficiaries, and there's quite a bit of upsides for the government too. Uh, it certainly limits, you know, it, it, it certainly, uh, you know, contains costs for the government. So uh, it's kind of a win-win for everybody. Medicare Advantage plans are regional. The same insurance company that may, the same insurance company may offer a variety of plans with different benefits and cost sharing from county to county. The most common types of Medicare Advantage plans include HMO, PPO, PFFS, and SNPs or special needs plans. Okay, uh, and you can see the essential resources for a list of all the Medicare Advantage plans. Uh, that is in the resources uh, section. Uh, with health maintenance organizations, enrollees must select a primary care physician within the network. Enrollees can only obtain services from in-network providers and hospitals except for emergencies. Prior authorizations are usually required for specialist visits and procedures. 
Uh, most HMO plans offer prescription drug benefits, and cost sharing is usually lower compared to other plan types, but with more restrictions. Uh, some HMO plans offer benefits at zero monthly premium. Preferred provider organization, uh, selection of primary care physician is often not required. Uh, cost sharing is lower when utilizing PPO network providers. PPO network pro is usually broader than the HMO network. Co-payments and co-insurance may be higher than uh, in the HMO plans. Most PPO plans offer prescription drug benefits. And most PPO plans charge a monthly premium in addition to the Medicare Part B premium. Private fee for service. Enrollees can obtain services from any eligible provider in the US who is willing to provide services to a PFFS, PFFS enrollee. The PFFS plan determines its own fee schedule, provider billing procedures, and the amount the provider is permitted to collect from the enrollee. Prior authorization is not allowed as a condition for enrollees to receive service. If a PFFS plan does not offer Part D benefits, members can enroll in a standalone prescription drug plan, uh, the Part D plan, while keeping the PFFS plan. Enrollees of HMO or PPO plans must disenroll from their plans in order to join a PDP plan, as we discussed earlier. Out-of-pocket costs may be higher than HMO and PPO plans due to the permission for a provider to balance bill. So this is not a real common option. Special needs plans. A special needs plan, or often referred to as a SNP, is designed to provide targeted care to Medicare beneficiaries who are institutionalized, dual eligible, dual eligible means Medicare, Medicaid eligible, or with specific chronic conditions. Also known as Medicare Advantage Coordinated Care Plans, or CCP. SNPs can be HMO, PPO, or point of service. Different types of SNPs include chronic condition SNPs, or a SNE SNP, dual eligible SNPs, or DSNP, and institutional, you got it, ISNP. Uh, all SNPs must provide Part D coverage, okay? All special needs plans must provide Part D coverage. So Ozzie and Harriet uh, will help us explain a little bit further, a little illustration here. They were on Medicare Part A and Part B, but they had options, including Medicare Part C or Medicare Advantage. It's a commercial managed care insurance authorized by Medicare, right? They elected to be covered under this option. So they no longer use their Medicare Part A and Part B, but now have Medicare Part C, Medicare Advantage. So that red, white, and blue card is out. The commercial card is in. CMS now pays the Medicare Advantage health plan a premium to cover Ozzie and Harriet. The health plan uses that premium to pay uh, for Ozzie and Harriet's health services in pl place of traditional Medicare. And the health plan does not receive the same premium for Ozzy as they do Harriet. You may remember that from earlier. Ozzy, again, he's healthy, sees his physician once a year, clean bill of health, no health conditions to speak of. And again, uh, Harriet is kind of a train wreck. She's a diff different story. Remember, she has diabetes and uses insulin. COPD requires home oxygen, has AFib requires anticoagulant therapy with regular monitoring. So uh, as you may remember from earlier, area is costlier to cover for healthcare expenses. So how does Medicare know how much to pay the health plan? This is, you know, we, we, we've covered this a couple times already based on documentation from her medical providers that support her conditions, okay? So the medical record, you know, and, and, and we have to we have to repeat this and reinforce this because it really is the foundation, okay? And so please bear with us, but we just want to make sure that it's clear. So CMS pays the health plan more for Harriet based on her health conditions. This is adjusting the premium due to her risk or risk adjustment. 
Okay, so remember from way back in the beginning, this is not about claims payment, okay? This is about the premiums that her health Medicare Advantage plan gets to provide her coverage, okay? And so Medicare Advantage risk adjustment methodology is HCC or hierarchical condition categories, okay? And let's take a look. There are 26, remember I said uh, when we were looking at CDPS, I said you'd see a similar looking graph or table, uh, and here it is. Uh, so there are 26 major disease groups or major categories that break out into 86 total HCCs, okay? Uh, infection, neoplasm has five HCCs in it. Uh, you may remember diabetes has three, uh, uncomplicated, uh, complicated chronic, and complicated acute, okay? And you can see, <clears throat> going down the list here, uh, you can see the major category name, and how many HCCs are in each? Some only have one. Complications, transplant, openings, and amputation only have each, one each. So uh, there is no hierarchy in, in those categories. If there's a diagnosis that fits in that HCC, then uh, there, is no, uh, there is no hierarchy that HCC counts, okay? So how many, how many HCCs could a patient possibly have? Well, 26, right? Actually, no. Uh, 20, 20, 25, 28, because uh, the infection category uh, does not trump, which we'll talk about in a moment. Okay. Uh, so here are the uh, major categories in the HCCs. Infection is HCC 1, 2, and 6, uh, one being HIV AIDS, two septicemia sepsis, and uh, six being opp opportunist infections. Now, I'm not going to go through all of these, but uh, as you can see, HCC 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 are the neoplasms. Um, and let's work backwards from 12. Breast, prostate, and other cancers, colorectal bladder and other cancers, lymphoma and other cancers, lung and other severe cancers, and metastatic cancer and acute leukemia. Okay? So, if a uh, beneficiary is unfortunate enough to have, say, breast or prostate cancer, but also has lung cancer or metastatic cancer or what have you, then only the most severe uh, one in a hierarchy is going to count. Now, here is just kind of a little rule of thumb, okay? The HCCs were <clears throat> developed in they're numbered chronologically, okay? But rule of thumb is in, in a hierarchy, okay, the lower the HCC number, the higher the weight, okay? So kind of, I don't know, counterintuitive, but, you know, for, uh, for neoplasms, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, okay? 8 is the lowest number, but it's the highest weight or most severe in the hierarchy. Okay, just a little rule of thumb. Uh, so uh, just going tabbing through here. Uh, remember when we looked at the commercial risk adjustment model, uh, you will not find pregnancy <laughs> uh, as an HCC in the Medicare model. Okay, so let's go through here. Just just giving you a you know a once through uh, different uh, 26 different categories and how they break out into 86 HCC. So uh, the way it kind of works out is we have the major categories, 26, that break out into 86 HCCs and the different hierarchies. You saw diabetes has three HCCs in it, and of course, only the most severe will count. Uh, you saw uh, neoplasms, there's five, and only the most severe will count. We'll look at a graphic on that in a minute. And so then we drill down to the diagnosis codes, okay? Uh, and this is determined through mappings. And the mappings are in the essential resources uh, section, okay? And we will be looking at that. But uh, so major categories, drills down to HCCs and hierarchies. And uh, how do we determine, you know, that? And that's from diagnosis codes. So um, when... 
when the condition categories are within the same hierarchy, okay, when a diagnosis, when there's diagno multiple diagnoses that are in the same hierarchy, only the most significant, and that's most severe, highest weight, however you want to put it, will be counted. This is known as trumping, okay? So, uh, you will see, um, it starts with this trumping table does, does not have one, two, or six, because even though they're in the same uh, HCC, even though they're in the same HCC, they don't trump, okay? Um, or I'm sorry, the same condition category, they don't trump. So uh, you'll see here on the left-hand side, the HCC, if HCC eight is present, nine, 10, 11, or 12 is not reported, okay? If HCC nine is present, 10, 11, or 12 is not reported, okay? If HCC 10 is present, 11 and 12 is not reported. And if HCC 11 is present, then 12 is not reported. Okay. Um, and let's just, let's just go through the same process with diabetes real quick. Uh, 17, if diabetes or acute complications is present, 18 and 19 are not reported. If diabetes or chronic complications is reported, then of course, we can't have, you can't have a, a diabe diabetic uncomplicated in a diabetic with complications, right? So uh, that stands to reason, okay? And it, it's, it's it, and that's a, you know, if you can remember that, that's a good way of understanding this whole hierarchy thing. So here again are the, you know, I, I, I like to use these as examples. Um, the neoplasm disease group, okay, has five HCCs. 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, okay? And, uh, you know, so if there's two different types of cancer, uh, you know, that map to two different HCCs, it's gonna be the highest one in the hierarchy that will count, okay? Um, the other thing I wanna, you know, reiterate, uh, just like I did when we're talking about the uh, different risk adjustment models, um, in the next module, we're going to show how to calculate a risk score. It's something as a professional, you need to understand how, the how and the why, but you don't have to calculate the risk score. CMS does that. Uh, so in the diabetes major disease group, there's three HCCs, 17, 18, and 19. Uh, 19 being diabetic with, without complication. Uh, once a diabetic develops a complication, uh, they cannot be an uncomplicated diabetic, so uh, 19 will go out the window, and it will be either 18 or 17. So uh, there are different parts to uh, a risk score, and we're going to show how to calculate the risk score in a separate module. But uh, this is a good way to introduce you to weights. Remember, in the very first module, we talked about uh, you know the the weights, right? Um, and so demographics is one element to a risk score. And uh, it, there's multiple factors that go into the demographic. And as you can see on the left, uh, gender is one, age. And if you look across the top row, you'll see some columns, okay? Community non-dual age, community non-dual disabled, Community FB dual aged, community FB dual disabled, community PB dual aged, community PB dual disabled, and institutional. So, uh, so how many parts do we have for demographics? Well, we have gender, we have age, we have original reason for entitlement. Okay, and that's what those columns are. Uh, community out. In, uh, this is a, a beneficiary who's out in the community not dual eligible, and their original reason for entitlement was they aged into Medicare. So you can see uh, that column starts at 65, right? There's dashes in zero up to 64 because they they were not, made, their original reason for entitlement was not they were disabled, they aged in at 65. The next column you'll see is community non-dual disabled. And you can see that Anybody from zero to 64, uh, if there's, you know, if they have not reached 65, they could only have been eligible uh, because of disability. Okay, and so you'll see 
uh, the original reason for entitlement stops at 65 because if they made it to 65 without being eligible for disability, then they aged in, right? Uh, the other columns are uh, FB dual and PB dual, okay? That's full benefit dual eligibility. That means eligible for Medicare and full benefits of Medicaid, or some, some qualify for partial Medicaid, and so that is PB dual, uh, partial benefit dual um, eligibility. And again, original reason for entitlement, age or disabled. So all of these things, so, you know, it, it's pretty much, you know, plotting this out. Okay, we have a, a male, uh, you know, I, uh, we're gonna look at Ozzy here in a minute. Uh, so let's see, so he's a male, 70 to 74 years old, and he aged in, to Medicare, so his his demographic would be 0.394, okay? Uh, and so it's just a matter of connecting the, the, the appropriate dots, okay? So, um, again, we have our, our 26 uh, condition categories, right? And Ozzy is healthy, he has no cats, no categories, right? And uh, over on the right, we have uh, Harriet, who has three cats, three, three categories, diabetes, uh, COPD, okay, and AFib. So these are three different categories, okay? So the, we don't have to worry about any, any trumping because there are three different condition categories and, and trumping only takes place when there's two uh, HCCs within a category that the patient is eligible for. Okay. Um, also, remember earlier that I said, um, what did I say? Uh, yep, and there was something I, I had said earlier and I can't remember what it was. So, um, so let's look at diabetes without complication. Okay. Uh, first, first HCC that Harriet has. Okay. And you'll see. Now, here is uh, the weight, okay, 0 0.105. She, she has diabetes. Um, now, I want to also point out, if you look at just above that, 17 and 18, diabetes with acute complications, diabetes with chronic complications, you're going to see that at this moment, that weight is the same. And you, so you might ask, well, why do they have two categories if the weight is the same? Well, that's just the way it works it, it, because next year they can re recalculate and it could be two different weights, you know, two, two different weights. So, um, so just, you know, people often ask that and I just want to throw that in there. Uh, so diabetes uh, without complication, 0 0.105, okay, for um, uh, Harriet's first HCC, okay. Remember she has uh, AFib. And so that's going to be HCC 96, specified heart arrhythmias, and has a weight of 0.268. And remember, she has COPD, that's HCC 111, and that is 0.335, okay? Now, when we talked about the commercial model, we talked about interactions, okay? And uh, and so that is another component of uh, the Medicare risk adjustment model is interactions, okay? And so uh, I had, I think I had used this uh, earlier, uh, congestive heart failure and diabetes. So if a beneficiary has congestive heart failure and diabetes, okay, they are gonna receive the weight for the HCC for congestive heart failure. They're gonna receive the weight for the HCC for diabetes, okay? But because these two conditions coexist in the same beneficiary, there's gonna be a weight for what's called an interaction. And that's 0 0.121. So uh, let's go back and look uh, at, so diabetes is 0 0.105. And let's see where is congestive heart failure. Uh, HCC 85, uh, left hand column, about six down, 0.331. So the 
uh, HCC 0.105 and uh, 0.331 would be the individual HCC weights, and that would be counted. But then 0.121 would be added because it's an interaction. Okay. And the final component to uh, to calculating a risk score is number of payment conditions. So if the beneficiary has one, two, or three HCCs, there is no additional weight. But once a patient has four HCCs or more, then there's an additional weight uh, for payment condition count, okay? And so uh, when, we, when we do risk score calculation, we'll, we'll, we'll show um, uh, Harriet uh, with three, and then we'll do uh, show her with four, okay? Uh, when we get to risk score calculation. So that is the Medicare Advantage and CMS HCC model, okay? And so now let's take a look uh, in the next module at calculating a risk score.